Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. We know we have a lot of competition for your attention. Uh, I, uh, I'm aware that you're taking us over Tom Brady. Uh, my son is going to be <laughs> furious with me for not going and getting his autograph for him. So uh, there we go, such is life. I'm also aware that you're choosing us over a, a panel with the portentous title, Can the, uh, the uh, Open World Economy Survive? And if the answer to that question is no, then of course we could all leave the conference straight away and <laughs> go to the Bahamas while we still have the chance. So anyway, thank you very much for, 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 for choosing us for your time. I think we are going to have a very interesting conversation today. Now this is, uh, I'm John Authors, I'm the uh, uh, Chief Markets Commentator for the Financial Times. We're very proud to be uh, one of the uh, sponsors helping uh, the Milken Institute with this remarkable conference. This is something of a sub-franchise uh, or, or an ingredient brand of the Milken Conference. The uh, uh, Reading the Tea Leaves session is a regular event. This year, given the particular circumstances, we're going to be aiming at answering a few very, uh, st very general questions. We've obviously had the best part of a decade uh, of remarkably cheap credit that has been associated with um, uh, of the growth of uh, passive management in general and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rise of the ETF in particular. It's also been associated with great difficulties for active managers, the reduction in the total size of, the, of uh, public markets in a sense that if you need uh, alpha, if you want to be able to generate alpha, it may be easiest to do that uh, in the private markets, not the public. Now, we are now beginning to see as central banks try to normalize interest rates, try to normalize monetary conditions, beginning to see uh, what looks like an end to those conditions. What we want to talk about today, what we're going to try to cover, is whether there are anomalies there, whether there are conditions that will allow uh, people to thrive in the new uh, situation. If we're beginning to see uh, a new regime coming in to replace the post-crisis regime we have got used to for so long. Now, I'd like to start, we've got a great panel, I'd like to start with Jody Gunsberg from uh, S&P Dow Jones, immediately to my right. Thanks for Thank you. taking part. Uh, you're obviously S&P has been very much at the forefront of uh, passive, uh, the passive revolution and more recently in smart beta. Is smart beta factor investing an, an option that can work uh, to close any anomalies that are showing uh, up in the in the uh, in the future as the, the investment regime begins to change uh, or is there a risk that uh, smart beta could ultimately generate more confusion we now have more than <coughs> three million indices out there in the world which is far more than the number of public stocks uh, is there a danger that the, the the very modern science of indexing and passive management is going to uh, eat the golden egg, whatever the, the analogy I'm looking for, eat the, the, the goose that lays the golden eggs. There's a lot of questions yes. that you just Sorry about that. asked me, yeah. so I will try to organize this Good and answer them in a way that can make sense for you. The um, whole movement of active towards passive has really been uh, growing in the last decade and I think where we need to start is separating not active and passive, but alpha and beta. Because when indices were first started, the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, they were just printed levels that were representing what the market looked like. Mm. And as academic research grew and the CAPM came to light, the S&P 500 was largely used as beta to represent the market risk. That's the systematic risk in the market, the way that the market looks, market cap weighted. Um, you know, there's more technology and financials than there are utilities, and there's no decisions being made, really. It's just the market proxy. As the, um, that benchmark gained popularity, active managers would benchmark themselves against it and any excess return positive or negative could be considered alpha so there's your line between beta and alpha um, as indexing and technology and data availability and computer uh, power became more available and cheaper 
we're able to put some of the choices that active managers would typically make into a systematic format that could follow indexing rules. I'll give you a very simple example. The S&P 500 that's market cap weighted can be considered beta as a market representation and it can also be considered passive. The S&P 500 equal weight is not beta. It has more weight in some of the smaller companies at the expense of the larger weight of the bigger companies. That is not what the world looks like. That's not systematic risk. That is a choice to equally weight which can be put into an index format and can be considered passive. Through the years, there's been a development, like John mentioned, there's over 3 million stock indices a day printed now. We print um, <coughs> almost a million a day. And some of that comes from more granular levels of indexes like sectors or industry groups or sub-industries where investors are starting to be able to track more closely segments of the market. And they're also, with the development of new products like ETFs, able to take positions using those indices. So investors have largely started to create alpha out of that beta that represents different market segments. And further along the spectrum, we've been able to take more things that Research has known for many years about size premiums or the value premium, and there's factors that have been <coughs> able to be put into index formats. And those are, I don't say taking away from active managers or opportunities necessarily, but where you can get some of the same choices or returns through passive indexing that you might be able to get through active management, then it becomes a question of what's the best way to get access and what are you paying for it and what's the transparency or the liquidity. And this is a pro an approach that can continue as the environment changes. You, you, uh, is the idea of a smart beta index that it's something that you're going to have to trade in and out of or is the idea of a smart beta index that it's something that you can have yeah. For all time. Well, first of all, I really don't like the term smart beta because yeah. last year the smartest beta was the S&P 500. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it all depends on the environment. But as we move into different environments with rising interest rates or inflation or volatility is picking up, there's different kinds of indices that address each of those environments today. So now I think what might really change is the way that investors do due diligence because mm. whereas a lot of analysts may look for managers to recommend or to invest in, now there are so many choices of indices. The question becomes, do you start doing the due diligence on index strategies either to better benchmark your manager or to actually get access to a strategy for a much cheaper price? OK. The, uh, the world is uh, steadily uh, changing. Could I now move over to uh, Anne Walsh, who's the uh, CIO of credit for Guggenheim? partners. What are the opportunities uh, for, um, uh, for, the, uh, for uh, uh, liquidity imbalances that many people are, are worried could be created um, by the uh, increase in the number of uh, ETFs and other passive strategies within, uh, within the credit universe? Uh, and is there any sense in which this is in credit we've moved to a top-down market rather than the traditional bottom-up market where people are taking a look at, uh, at the uh, underlying credit, worth of, uh, credit, credit worthiness of, of companies and making their investment decisions from there. So there's a lot of layers Again. in that question, so uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. But um, you know, in the land of fixed income, uh, uh, just as a, uh, a statement, uh, I want to let you know I'm, I'm biased towards active management. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, in terms of active management for fixed income, the whole idea is then to mitigate or reduce risk. Um, and I think at the outset, we probably need to define the risk set in uh, fixed income as being very asymmetric. So what happens is, is that if all goes according to plan, the day you buy a bond, you know, you get a coupon, uh, assuming you paid par for it, and then at some point in time in the future it matures, you get your principal back, you get your coupon along the line, and that is happiness. Uh, and then what ends up happening is, uh, in the terms of the asymmetry, is the risk of default. 
Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the risk that you don't get paid that principal or, and or that interest along the, along the line. And so um, you, you can't take the asymmetry out of fixed income. Mm. We can change the box it comes in. Uh, and of course, the rise of the ETFs, particularly in credit and fixed income, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a method, if you will, or a technique. Hopefully, investors are able to do two things. One, get immediate liquidity uh, on, uh, on fixed income uh, in a way that, um, that doesn't exist necessarily outside of the rates uh, arena yeah. right now. Uh, and two, maybe hopefully to, through diversification of a whole uh, portfolio of fixed income assets to reduce this risk of this asymmetry. Um, the problem is, is that uh, ETFs have done something to the fixed income market uh, that, that may be actually introducing additional risk. Uh, and that is that, um, that your, the, the option of immediate liquidity is being given to the investor. Uh, at the same time, uh, the risk is that particularly in times of market dislocation or seizure, uh, where liquidity starts to dry up, and we'll talk about where it is right now. Hmm. Um, all of a sudden, ETF managers can't sell assets when they need to to, uh, to meet that option uh, to uh, liquidate an investor's position in the ETF. Uh, what we have seen uh, over the course of time uh, as uh, regulation has changed post-crisis is that dealer balance sheets, uh, particularly those intermediaries that tend to uh, offer liquidity into the market between fixed income sellers and buyers uh, for the longest time their business was to hold these assets and that made they facilitated that trading that was going on uh, today dealer balance sheets are down to very very small sums relative to history particularly in high yield uh, credit and this this sort of unwillingness to act as an intermediary is challenging the liquidity that's out there right now Right now, those intermediaries are starting to act more as simple brokers, um, arranging a buyer and a seller to do a transaction or trades. Um, the more this develops, the more risk is inherent in ETFs at times of seizure. And right. times of seizure can happen rather rapidly without a whole lot of warning, uh, and uh, again, raising the risk. Uh, if you were in the panel this morning, you heard Scott Minard, our chief investment yes. officer, talk about um, sort of additional risks in this space in high yield and bank loans, and that is the normal time of settlement for these very illiquid assets that have worked their way into the ETF space uh, is substantially different than, again, that option for liquidity that's being given to the investor. So there's risks are rising. Uh, and to the point where um, both the Fed and the Treasury are, are really taking notice of this uh, and, uh, and, and may or may not start to develop some regulation around it, mm. particularly in the area of gating. So for those investors who are looking for immediate liquidity, they may not get it. Uh, and uh, we'll find out what, what ultimately comes with regulation. But, but for now, I'll just say that the risk of, uh, of illiquidity in the market is already increasing as well as the fact that we've put these assets into a particular form uh, that may or may not provide that liquidity when, when investors expect it. Now, one direct follow-up to that, I suppose, is if there is a greater risk uh, in, the, in this universe, does that mean that there is an opportunity for you to get on the other side of that risk? Is that, uh, it, does this create opportunities for patient capital? Well, yes, uh, and uh, we can look at, uh, you know, post-crisis as well. Mm. Uh, and by the way, you know, ETFs aren't the first investment vehicle to suffer illiquidity or, or fail uh, uh, in price, which hasn't happened yet, but it could. Mm. Uh, closed-end funds. Uh, we saw mm. with the tremendous amount of leverage that they had uh, pre-crisis, so many of them uh, performed poorly, particularly those of limited sector. Uh, mandate um, and uh, and so you know th this is not the first time we've seen this this play uh, before as risks begin to rise and there is and there is a rush to the bank uh, but but for patient capital uh, mm. the concept would be to to wait it out uh, for the moment when there is this dislocation mm. uh, but you know on the other hand people want to stay fully invested and it's hard to pick the best time right. uh, and uh, and to be that patient. And Scott said in the earlier panel that even your clients who are long-termists regard long-term as thinking about next quarter. Exactly. Uh, which might not be the best way of uh, waiting as a credit bust. Mm -hmm. If I could move now to, uh, to Jason Karp of, uh, of Tourbillon um, Partners. If I could ask you 
presumably the environment of the last decade you would think has been difficult for long short equity managers. You've had low dispersion, high correlation, low volatility. Has the uh, long period of low volatility and also the, uh, uh, the rise of passive investing, has that created new opportunities for alpha for you and where are they? Yeah, so I, I think uh, most certainly, I, I think to frame the question, um, it's important to recognize what's changed. Hmm. Um, so uh, I'm in my 20th year now of uh, being in the hedge fund business. Congratulations. <laughs> um, it'll be 21st next month. Right. And um, when I began, so there have been two massive changes in those 20 years. Hmm. Uh, the first is competition. And, and, you know, when I got into the business, you know, having a Bloomberg was a source of edge. You know, being able to read was actually an advantage. Um, and, and, you know, I routinely remember people going to the library to get historic 10Ks and 10Qs. And there was extreme um, uh, payoff to doing really hard work from a fundamental perspective. Yeah. Um, this was also when there were only a f several hundred hedge funds. Uh, today there's over 10,000. So the, just from a kind of economics 101 perspective, um, the, the, the competition has increased massively, uh, which has created a lot of distortions and, and a lot of the easy money and areas that were uh, ripe for easy alpha uh, are no longer there. Um, the second major uh, change has been the rise of systematic strategies. Yeah. And these are quant, this is passive, this is risk parity, this is CTAs. Um, you know, if you look 10 plus years ago, uh, they estimated that between 40 and 50% of the average daily volume in the stock market was from what they call fundamental discretionary, discretionary managers, mm -hmm. meaning people who were trading stocks were people who actually had opinions about what those companies were. Uh, today that number has been confirmed at less than 10%. So over 90% of the daily trading volume is coming from machines who do not have a view on what these companies are and do not have a view on what these companies do and do not have a view on what these companies are worth. And if, if, if you think about that in terms of what kind of distortions that creates, fundamental managers, people who actually have opinions about what companies are worth, hmm. are no longer the marginal price setters. Yeah. And so the quants, and, and it's not so much quants, it's just systematic strategies, uh, are really doing that. And so the way that we approach it is we tend to look for opportunities that are um, thematic in nature, that have uh, nonlinearities to them that are harder to model. Um, and I'll give you a few examples where, you know, you have to sort of think about it and contextualize it as what can quants easily do and what do systematic strategies like to do and what are things that they're particularly not good at, um, uh, at least today. You know, I, I, I can't tell you what it's going to be like in 10, 15 years, but as of today, quants are particularly not good at things that don't have historic information, where you actually need a precedent or you need data in the past to figure out what's going on in the future. Um, quants are particularly bad at figuring out um, uh, thematic or what I would call, uh, you know, that would require some human imagination about where things are going. And so here's an example. So a few years ago, uh, as recently as a few years ago, uh, when there was all this hype about how low rates were permanently going to be, um, there was a massive influx of capital into bond proxies, mm. stocks that look like bonds. Um, and that was staples, it was utilities, and it was REITs. And these companies became as overvalued as they've ever been. Um, and, and even in spite of this, or, or while this overvaluation is happening, one of the areas that we've spent a tremendous amount of research on at our firm is uh, the vertical of health and wellness and what's going on, particularly with consumption behaviors uh, as it relates to uh, food in particular. And so companies like General Mills and Kellogg's and Campbell's at this time, because they were bond proxies that paid a dividend and appeared to be stable, and these are companies that have been around for 50 to 100 years, and so there was a perception of stability, um, you could actually buy Google for a cheaper price than companies who made cereal. That actually <laughs> happened. Um, and you could have put on a long short spread of short General Mills, long Google, um, and you've made you know, well over 50% over the last few years in doing that. Um, 
And, and the reason that existed was twofold. The first was a lot of the systematic strategies were just buying this factor, which was things that look like bonds. And these systematic strategies weren't actually doing the bottom-up research on what was going on with consumption behavior. And in this country, at least, people are, are caring much more deeply about what are the ingredients in their food. This population, and particularly the millennials, are much more focused uh, on, on uh, transparency and, and the quality of what's in their food, and they don't want boxed junk anymore. Um, but this was not something that you could figure out on a monthly time horizon. You needed to do real thematic work, and it provided a huge opportunity. And I think going forward, <coughs> there are several sectors, which we can get into later, uh, that I think fit this bill, where they're difficult to model today. There's a very strong, durable, secular tailwind behind them. Um, machines don't like them right now. Systematic strategies don't know how to figure them out. Mm. And I think on the, that's on the public side. And then obviously on the yeah. private side, there's plenty of really rich opportunities. Okay, but in, in some respects, the great opportunities in, in uh, stock markets have always come from those opportunities where you know there's a lot of value there in the future and it's just so difficult to measure it to work out where it is. In some ways, though, those opportunities have deepened. They've got greater as a result of the, uh, the move to systematic strategies. Yeah, I mean, it, systematic strategies are inherently uh, pro-momentum. Um, mm. You know, most quantitative strategies have a significant momentum component to them. Uh, Trend-following strategies are, by definition, momentum. Uh, and then human behavior, as it allocates to passive, is also inherently pro-momentum because those passive flows tend to chase what's been working. And, at, and so over the last, call it five to ten years, yes. the amount of capital that has gone into pro-momentum strategies has gone up parabolically, while the, the capital that's been in more contrarian, uh, more value-oriented strategies has left because people just can't stay in business. You know, the duration of the, of the capital isn't long enough, and so you've had this huge switch, um, which has created a lot more opportunity to be contrarian, but you have to have the time horizon. Right. Now, if I could turn, we now have two Alexes to complete <laughs> our panel. If I could turn to Alex Denner first from Sarissa uh, Capital. Uh, you've been a great practitioner of one of the most obvious ways for, uh, to produce alpha in this environment, which is to be activist, to, uh, to uh, actually engage with, with companies. How great are the opportunities to do that? How much easier might it be uh, to do that in, a, in the private market, which is where many people assume the kind of uh, 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 strategies you're, you're working with might work better in this environment? So. Um is thank you for having me. We, we, mm. we think the opportunity uh, is, is going to get better, you know, every year in activism. So what we do is we, you know, we look at companies that we believe are, are suboptimal in terms of the way they allocate capital or the operations of the company. And um, we will seek to get involved by putting leverage on the company. We'll typically go on the board and try to, try to fix the company, try to improve mm. their capital allocation or try to improve their operations. Um, in the area of healthcare where we specialize, it's, it's, it's a very interesting situation because the, the barriers to entry and margins in healthcare when a product is successful, of course, it's very, very hard to make a product that helps people, unfortunately, for society. But when a company does that, um, there's very high barriers to entry and, and, and very high uh, margins. So these companies can kind of, they don't necessarily, uh, it's very easy for them to become lazy with capital allocation and operations. Mm. Um, as as the, with the growth of index funds and ETFs, you have more and more as a, the, the percent owners of, of, of um, these companies tend to be passive investors. And they're paying less and less attention to the, the operations of the company. Mm -hmm. If you think about the capital markets fundamentally are, are at least purportedly designed to sort of allocate capital efficiently to the, to the companies that use the capital best to create value. And um, when you have a situation with uh, with ETFs and index funds where there's very large amounts of money going into them, and a, let's say a particular company has a weighting in an index that suggests that, you know, it, it has a big weighting and suggests that it should be an important part of important indices, then there'll be a lot of capital allocated to that company. So it, a lot of these things will, in a sense, become self-fulfilling that, okay, this mm -hmm. company's stock price is going to do well, and, and, and therefore, we're, you know, we can, we can be, uh, we at the company, 
uh, can be a little bit less careful with the way we allocate capital. I think activism is sort of becoming, going to become more and more necessary. And, and I would argue a better and better opportunity over time. It's a great opportunity right now, but just going to get better and better over time as more and more dollars are invested <coughs> in ETFs because there's nobody there that's sort of watching the operations of the company. Right now, um, you know, the, the um, large uh, passive mm. managers are sort of getting more involved in, in, in governance and issues like that. Um, and what their, you know, what their issues are is that the, um, you know, they're, they're doing that. I don't think they're doing that at a particularly uh, fast pace. They're kind of going slowly. They're not at all getting involved or very little in the actual operations of the company. And it is reasonable for a share owner, you know, if you, if you own stock in a company, you own a piece of the business and it's completely legitimate to have a view as to sort of how that business is being mm -hmm. run. And is the capital being deployed efficiently? Is the company being, you know, do they have the right number of salespeople, or the right number of R&D people, or whatever? And um, the, the larger index holders do not have views on that kind of thing. So I think it's going to create uh, it, more and more opportunities <coughs> for, for, you know, what happens is capital gets deployed in a suboptimal way. And mm. as an activist, you can come in and kind of push them a little to become a little bit more, um, a little bit more capital efficient or improve their operations and create a lot of value. Now, does that uh, operate in a way where they can ultimately, in their all sort of dumb way, help you or do they get in the way? In other, in other words, if you give a lead, will you find that the, uh, you know, the, the names at the, the top of the shareholder register follow your lead um, with, with great relief or does it become more of a problem harnessing shareholders behind your points of view to have uh, <coughs> to have this big weight of passive management on the on the on the shareholder registers. So um, it, it's hard to see how that will evolve over time. <coughs> I don't really, you know, like right <coughs> now, I think a lot of this is sort of relationship things where you know at Sarissa, I I I think we have good relations with a lot of the the um, the larger index funds, and they know us, and they and we have a track record of being able to successfully create value. Mm. So they'll kind of, they'll give us the benefit of the doubt. Um, you can certainly point to circumstances where, you know, we did a, a situation on a, on a company, it's a $2 billion company, it's not too, too large, Innoviva, mm. which was a company, it's sort of an interesting example of how governance works in the United States. This is a company that um, literally all they do is collect a royalty check from another company. They have no business at all. <laughs> they literally just get, get a check in the mail. I mean, it's wired, but I like to tell the story, I like to get it in the mail. You know, they open the envelope, flip over the check, endorse it, write for deposit only, go to the bank. That's their whole business. But somehow, and this company spent, you know, tens of millions in SGNA doing this and, you know, had governance that was just abhorrent. I mean, it was, they, you know, they didn't have a governance committee in, on the board and just stuff that, like, would be 101 for, for, for governance. Um, so, you know, we got involved with this situation um, and, you know, it was interesting in that, in that we got support from virtually every single active manager, and in this case, it was. It, there's a long story here, which I'm happy to tell off, you know, kind of yeah, uh, sure. later. But um, there were, there were, uh, there was one large shareholder that owned uh, a third of the company that was, you know, not going to be voting with us. So we basically needed to get every single large shareholder. And again, it's a long story, but there was reluctance to support change by you know, some of the biggest uh, ETFs. And you sort of say, geez, if you can't support change here, when could you do it? You know, like Vanguard, for instance, supported us, but not everybody else did. It ended up working out really well, and you know, uh, there, you know, we were able to get rid of all the old directors who were terrible and, and, and bring, in, bring in a new group. But it was a long battle to get there, and you, and you could see that these, these organizations still need right. to to, to get up to speed with what's going on at the so companies. So they, they create anomalies for you, but they can make it a bit harder for you to correct or profit from those That's right. anomalies, which is worse. That's exactly okay. right, yeah. I'm exactly. sure we can discuss this one, that, that <laughs> aspect further. Now, if I could turn to Alex Ropers of General Atlantic, our, our, our final Alex. Yeah. Thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, again, if I could ask you much the, the, the same question. You very uh, involved as a as an active shareholder, very active, have very active engagement with the companies that uh, that you hold. 
uh, is that easier or harder in the current environment and would it be easier in the many a lot of the conventional wisdom at this point is that it's uh, easier to engage with companies in the private markets than the public at this point. Are there opportunities still to do that in the public markets? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me on the panel, and thank you all for, for coming here to this uh, session. Uh, so I'm a value investor, and uh, look at companies as if you're buying a house or a car or a dishwasher. You're basically yes. you're looking for value, and you, you compare it and shop, and you do your due mm -hmm. diligence, and you want to make money on it, or you want to at least have good value, good use out of it. And mm -hmm. um, you know, started that in 1988. And you know, if you look at activism, you know, in the 80s we had, to, thanks to Mr. Milken, largely the junk bond market was very vibrant, and every corporation, every private equity firm, was a was an activist. You know, and quite often a hostile activist. Um, activism is just a tool for us. Uh, we've decided, as a private equity business owner mentality, to go into the public market to find very undervalued companies. Um, you know, this is. Uh, this environment is no different than any other. I don't really care. I mean, uh, I've decided to go from private, you know, I was in a mm. private environment uh, as a corporate development guy for companies into the public market because I don't like illiquidity and I don't like paying premiums for companies. So right. we buy it six times EBITDA, get out at nine. If private equity gets involved, if they get their hands on the kind of quality companies we can buy in these inefficient markets, uh, they're lucky to pay nine or 10 times uh, EBITDA. Mm. So our whole world is in mid cap, two to $10 billion, 10 to two to ten billion dollar companies. Why that range? Because we like to be a sizable, significant minority shareholder with liquidity, and being able to obviously get into these companies with very attractive values, roll up our sleeves, engage with management, um, only to the point where we need to get better understanding to see if we should be in this company, how we should size it, etc. If we then can enhance and accelerate shareholder value in a constructive, respectful way, with them getting all the credit and us retaining the liquidity, so much the better. But this environment is no different. I think, uh, yes, there's more quant stuff, more ETF stuff on the password, more mutual funds. Uh, there's a chance for a flash crash or for a real crash any moment. That doesn't change the course of the economy, that does, well, unless it's really a systemic situation like 08, there was clearly something else going on. But other than that, it's just a very fertile hunting ground for stock pickers. And, and don't forget, of 99.6% or something like that, could be off by a tenth of all uh, professionally managed equity portfolios are more than 30 stocks. And to me, that's almost like you have almost an index. I mean, a Dow 30, right? There's 30 stocks already. Mm. So we are concentrating in the US on six core positions. We have a global fund with, you know, adding two to those six, another four or five in Europe and four or five in Japan. And uh, we're having a portfolio that's trading less than 10 times earnings in this market. Lots of catalysts, so it's, it's a pretty attractive environment. So in many ways, your, your ultimate clients are paying you to own companies for them rather than to manage portfolios. Not own them. I mean, we would like to be in them for three three yeah. days if we can. If, if we buy a stock <laughs> and it gets taken over three days later, we're happy to be out of it. Uh, so no, uh, typically the holding period is 12 to 24 months. We've been in a, hmm. in some situations, uh, one in Japan for seven years, and it's gone up sevenfold, thank God. Uh, and it's still hmm. cheap uh, because it's done so phenomenal. We have a, a situation in the US where it hasn't gone that well, but we've had you know, we bought 38 million shares, sold 30 million shares over eight years. And that right. company is, uh, again today, and we've been constantly involved for eight years, is a, is a very good value. It's seven times uh, PE with corporate action, activism, and takeover, all three catalysts present. So it is a very good market to be a stock picker, to be a value investor. Um, and all the, all the other stuff is, to me is noise, it's just liquidity. There's enough liquidity for, for guys like us to, to operate. Now, if we could broaden the, the talk now to take a look at the uh, Again, this is the kind of thing that S&P and, uh, and others have taught us to look in terms of, of factors and mm. styles. Plainly, the momentum style of in, investing, which uh, uh, often people tend to regard as the bad guy of the, of the, the, uh, the, uh, the different styles, um, i.e. the <coughs> winners keep winning relative to losers who keep losing over time. Momentum has had a remarkably strong run post-crisis with relatively few of the big reversals that uh, momentum tends to have. Meanwhile, value, which most of us have been uh, taught to regard as, the, uh, as the, the good guys from Graham and Dodd through Buffett onwards, has with a, a few interruptions had a very bad time of it post-crisis. Are there reasons to think that that is going to change? What is going to be the catalyst that does begin to see a move away from momentum and towards uh, towards value and other other uh, traditional fundamentalist approaches 
we'd like to go ahead. So, um, look, I, I, it will change. Uh, you know, the, the history of the market is, is, is things are in favor and out of favor, and that, and that, that kind of uh, <coughs> cycles back and forth. I think with respect to, um, you know, I tend to be a value investor, so that's the bias uh, we have. I think that with respect to momentum and things like this, there, you know, there have been a bunch of companies that have been doing very well, you know, kind of, they've changed, there's some very high profile companies, we all know them, that have sort of changed business in a fundamental way and, and are getting economic rents from that that people didn't think were sort of available to them even a decade ago. And, and I think that has caused a lot of the sort of performance in, in the momentum mm -hmm. area where, you know, if there's a company that really has changes things dramatically, it takes a long time for people to figure that out, right? Mm. It's not just, it's, it's, you know, you have to believe it and you have to say, well, is, are things really different this time? And, and, that, and that takes time and that takes years. So those companies tend to be sort of, quote unquote, undervalued relative to maybe their DCF if you believe their whole story uh, for many years. And I think that's played out. Now, the nature of those things is that they play out and then they play out too much and they go, you know, the pendulum swings mm. too far the other way. Yeah. Um, you know, I tend to be of the view that, in, in, uh, for what it's, it's worth, one penny, right? But tend to be of the view that we're kind of getting to a place where that, th that we have pushed that a little bit too, too far here. I mean, in classically, at the moment, that would be the FANG stocks, which now right. tellingly do have their own index, not an S&P one, but they do have their own. Uh, uh, they do have their, once, once it's been recognized and been turned into an index, that might be a bad sign. So <laughs> exactly. The likes of Google have shown momentum because it turns out they were great value, as, as we heard earlier, for a long time. That's the point you made. Well, okay. what, I mean, these things are very hard to time, sure. is one of the issues mm. with picking your style and factor at the right time. Mm. You know, between momentum, value, quality, low vol, you've got all of these factors that are mm. available today and timing them is hard. It's been shown again and again and again that this is a difficult thing to do mm. and most people get it wrong. So one of the trends is towards the multi-factor investing where you're combining a lot of the different factors in order to diversify the risk of one factor performing against another. But this, these are the strategies that the Passive investing has grown into again. You know, I've heard across the panel now mm. a few references to indexing, but in still the mind frame of beta, but it's not necessarily <coughs> beta. And right. even in, um, I think, an article that you wrote about the number yeah. of indices, you showed over 40% of the indices are sector indices yep. now. Hmm. That's people taking bets on what they think may work. It's even hmm. hedge fund managers going short some of the ETFs in certain sectors because shorting some specific stocks are sometimes hard to do and get the timing right. Yep. So they short a sector and then they go long a stock that they like, something like that. Um, so we've seen this incredible growth of creating opportunities, alpha, and also combining in order to diversify risk. And I think that in the factor area, we started with these single factors. I mean, this stuff goes back to, I don't know, the 50s, Fama and French, yeah. where we're talking about factors. So there's nothing new that's happening right now. It's just that with the availability of them, that mm -hmm. they're becoming more accessible and more popular. So people are really paying attention and trying to figure out where they should be. but the timing story hasn't changed and people haven't really gotten better at timing. Um, we have a report that we put out that shows active management versus indexing. And mm. it's difficult for active managers to outperform the benchmark for any length of time. Um, I think over five year periods, the benchmark, S&P 500, so that's really the beta, that's not any mm. sort of smart beta. Uh, outperforms 85% of managers. And if you do it year by year, after about five years, you might have like 3% left of active managers that continue to outperform. So there's really a difficult job in timing, but if the active managers can do it, and if they persist, then perhaps it is worth paying them for what they do. But again, it's difficult to time this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, 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 um, so I think there's a couple pieces to mm. this. I, I think um, 
certain value strategies mm. um, today, I think, are doomed um, because, you know, and, and we'll just use the 20 years ago and we'll go back mm. even farther to 30, 40, 50, 60 years mm. ago when these books on value investing were written. Mm. Um, is, you know, back then you could actually find companies who were trading less than their cash in their bank accounts. Yes. Like, when, when, when our legends became as rich as they did, you could literally buy dollar bills for 50 cents. Um, that doesn't really exist anymore. And so the rise of competition um, and, and the availability of data has made what I'll call traditional deep value investing, uh, where you're just screening off of things like PE metrics and, and measures of mm. cheapness, there's enormous adverse selection in doing that. Um, because you're presuming that the millions and millions of market participants are not seeing what you're seeing and that you've discovered something that everyone else has just glazed over, which mm. I think is hubris. Right. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, you're, you're tending to invest in companies that have severe structural problems right. um, where you think you're buying a, a good cheap PE while the E itself is going like this right. um, <laughs> and it's trying to chase a boulder down a hill. So. Right. Um, I think that part is definitely structurally uh, difficult. Right. However, there are pockets, uh, which, which certainly speaks to what Alex does mm. and, and, the, and the role of, of being much more concentrated. There are pockets of extraordinary value. Uh, there are pockets where there are names that are not structurally declining, that actually are growing. Um, but machines and systematic and everyone else doesn't want to deal with it because it's just so painful to own something that just keeps going down. Um, right. And, and uh, but you know, if, if you do enough work and, and you, you have enough duration, you can find plenty of opportunities of things that are actually growing, um, that are despised, that are value. Uh, but you have to be much more selective today. And, and so I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a view on when momentum will stop and when value will kick in. I do know that value has become much more of a graveyard uh, where there are diamonds scattered all over it, um, mm. but it's, it's, it's kind of difficult picking. Could you, before we move on, could you just give us an idea of one or two sectors where, which continue to go down, which are creating those opportunities? Oh, sure. I mean, nice. <laughs> you know, I, I just referenced the whole General Mills situation mm -hmm. where uh, that was the go-go sector when, when people were searching for bond proxies. Consumer staples today um, are, are the hated sector now. So within literally two years, it went from the most loved to the most hated. Right. Um, now, I, I think, again, there's a, there's a structural reason why consumer staples are now acting like death um, uh, for mm. all the reasons that, that we had negative opinions on them two, three years ago. Mm. But not all consumer staples are created equally. Um, and so there, there are plenty of names that do not have structural headwinds um, that are not necessarily at the, uh, at the risk of sort of the Amazon effect. Um, and so there's, there's actually plenty of opportunities in that sector. Energy is another sector where, um, you know, energy basically since I'd say 15, uh, people were so scarred by the, whole, the fact that the whole sector could go down 50% in a year that it's sort of become um, uninvestable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, energy stocks, which we don't generally do because they're so cyclical, but energy stocks have uh, not really bounced relative to how much no, it's oil It's remarkable how little they've bounced compared um, to the oil price. And, yeah. and part of that is because the people were so scarred with how much they actually could lose in a year from the cyclicality of oil and gas that there's just no demand for these shares. And, and eventually things get cheap enough where they get taken private. Um, we're starting to see this happening in a, in, a, in a number of areas where stocks are getting cheap enough that either private equity steps in, other companies are stepping in, or the companies themselves are just buying uh, enormous amount of their own stock back. Um, and, and so the, the good news about being long oriented, um, if you have a long duration, is that you know, things, as long as the fundamentals don't deteriorate, things get cheap enough mm. where the invisible hand does correct it. Nice. Is that your uh, experience? And do you see, uh, do you see value? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, so sorry. On, on your question about the cycle and whether, yeah. you know, uh, value and growth and all that, and we, we, we published a piece for whatever it's worth uh, 
think in the middle of 2016 and uh, calling for an inflection point in the cycle. And the cycles are seven to ten years. Typically, mm. we all, I think, agree that March of 2000 was a inflection point, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. from growth to value, and it was for us was phenomenal that that whole run. The key thing is for value managers to make money in a growth cycle too, and outperform the index at mm -hmm. least uh, during a growth cycle, which we've been able, thankfully, to do before that March 2000 period. Then after there was a massive gap, where we outperformed the index by by you know so much that you know it's still hugely important to, to us that period. Right. And then you go, you know, you have this murky period, I guess, with uh, 07 is still very, very good anyway for us. And then 08 happens and 09. So you have, and then we went into the social media, the whole FANG period. So you have yeah. basically people agree generally, we've had a 10 year growth cycle. Uh, it accelerated in 2015 when you had two macro factors, which is the oil price decline from 100 to 25 and, and dollar strength, you know, by 30 to 80% mm -hmm. across all kinds of uh, currencies. These two macro factors paralyze people into some some level of fear, and when fear hits the public equity markets, two things happen. One, money comes out of the market, whatever stays goes to the large caps, particularly those not affected by those macro factors, i.e. the whole social, social media fan complex. Mm -hmm. So it was an extraordinary acceleration of an eight year growth cycle in 2015, accumulating into two, early 2016. In February of 2016, that's why it's so important, two macro factors, the mm -hmm. ones that caused this acceleration in the growth cycle and the divergence and the desperation, if you will, for anybody else in the stock right. market, uh, stopped, you know, and they turned. And then once yeah. they turned, now we were like, we could all breathe again. Like we suddenly, you know, we started to perform like the index, it's not outperforming yet, because the growth cycle has arguably still continued, right? I mean, you would still look at the FANGs doing very well in 17, yes. early 18, but we're keeping up with it with a whole bunch of mid-cap value stocks. You know, right. and we love our chances. I mean, th those guys are all trading. It's a huge herd that's just been piling down the, the, uh, the planes uh, of, of the equity market, are trading at 30, 40, 50 times earnings with very risky models in many cases. Huge uh, operating profit margins that perhaps cannot be sustained in our view. Growth mm -hmm. rates that cannot be sustained because of size and everything else. And we're sitting with a whole bunch of great companies, are all buyable by corporations and private equity, trading at eight, nine times uh, earnings on PEs. You know, so it's a, uh, it's a great situation. I think uh, the herd's got to be very careful. The herd's obviously been piling hundreds of billions of dollars into BlackRock and ETFs and uh, what have you. And indeed, they're not watching what they're buying. They're just chasing whatever's been going up. So I think it's a very, very cool environment for individuals to pick stocks, for value managers and you know, concentrated managers of other strategies to pick stocks. But do not diversify madly if you're after a it's compound growth rate. But we're in a value environment that's been masked by the FANG phenomenon. No, it's it's, it's, um, it's like it's changing of the tide. It seems to be a two-year process. I mean, we can't wait for like the FANGs to take a 20% knock because that will ba basically you know, take the S&P into a flat stage. And then, of course, between private equity having a trillion dollars to spend, corporations with a lot of cash and still lower interest rates, uh, there, you see more M&A, you know, particularly in mm. the buyable or financeable area of two to $10 billion type companies. You have any risk, many? Well, I've just heard a couple of things mm. um, repeatedly. So I've heard a few times that index investors aren't paying attention. There's a mm. lot of different kinds of indices. The S&P 500, mm. again, which I've described as beta, is a different kind of index than, say, the upstream energy sub-industry group. Um, mm. In energy, right, energy didn't go up as much as oil prices because companies hedge their oil. And if you start to look inside of the sector and you look at large companies versus small companies, what you see is that the large companies underperform the small companies because they're more likely to hedge because they're more exposed to the price volatility. And then when you further split it out into upstream and downstream, you see that the upstream perform far better than the downstream in the rising oil because they're the producers and the sellers of the oil versus the ones who are consuming it. So mm. as the commercial consumers, of course, when the prices rise, it hurts. So nice. you have to see these differences. And with the availability now of ETFs and very specialized products that are coming from indexing, to say that indexing and indexers aren't paying attention, I don't think is accurate. I think that there are certain passive beta strategies mm. where 
those are more reflective of just what the general market is doing, but then there are a lot of very specific rules and specifications that go into other types of indices that allow views to be shown inside of indexing. Well, yes, a little bit different in the fixed income, yeah. but kind of to that point, um, I think there is quite a bit of naive investing going on uh, mm -hmm. that's index strategies. Uh, if we look at the Barclays Ag, for example, and there's a number of indices out there uh, that are sort of, you know, kind of replicating that. Um, the Barclays Ag, uh, in fact, we produce a piece called the Core Conundrum. Uh, it's become the mm -hmm. uh, index of choice against which managers compare themselves. Um, it, happens in, it, it also happens to be about um, not quite half, a little bit less than half of the entire U.S. fixed income market. So uh, if the U.S. fixed income market is about $40 trillion, uh, it's approximately $19 trillion of assets that appear in this index. Um, and so many pension plans and individual investors think that's core investments, that's core fixed income. And the problem is, is that in this rising rate environment, and we've only seen rates come up, I mean, it may feel like a whole lot, obviously, at the short end, but on the 10-year, we've only seen rates come up about 25 basis points from about 2.5 to just under, or excuse me, 50 basis points from about 2.5 to up to towards 3. Um, and, uh, and so, but that sort of small move, I mean, maybe on a percentage basis, um, has turned the ag negative because it's so mm. um, focused on and so biased into uh, government securities. Uh, and so what so many pension plans or investors are doing is a sort of barbelling. They're saying, okay, this is going to be my core part of my portfolio, and then I'm going to barbell into credit or quote unquote alternatives, whatever that may be, whatever universe that is. Uh, and it doesn't fit neatly uh, to my earlier point, doesn't fit neatly into uh, a, a commingled type of a pooled product uh, that's available particularly to retail investors. So, uh, and oh, by the way, it takes a much longer timeline, generally speaking, to sort of play out uh, in terms of the performance. So you have a lot of investors out there who are kind of um, potentially getting the worst of both worlds. If we happen to have, as we would expect in the next couple of years, a fairly significant risk off moment, investors could be caught with a poor performance in their core portfolio as well as a tremendous price risk that's going to be happening in that other part of their portfolio that they're barbelling. Uh, so you've got the worst of potential both worlds for fixed income investors coming in the next couple of years. Could I ask one final question before we, before we move, it over to the, uh, move it over to the audience? It's uh, amazing how, how difficult it is to, to, uh, to cover everything in just one. Hour, but we we do have this very important move that uh, rates are beginning to come back. We actually do have a shift towards quantitative tightening within this particular country. Whether we're really tightening, given the amount of the money's fungible and the, there's still plenty of money sloshing around elsewhere, is another matter. But plainly, the, uh, the the direction is is changing. What opportunities get created by uh, this shift in rates, assuming that it continues? So it's sort of the, uh, an area that is uh, particularly of appeal right now are asset-backed securities or other particularly floating rate securities like bank loans. Mm. Uh, and bank loans are a good investment uh, for uh, institutional investors. I, you know, I, I question whether they belong or have a place in an ETF. Um, but the problem right now is, is that so many of them have come up in price, they're trading right around par. Uh, and so what you're really doing is sort of clipping a coupon. And as short mm. rates go up, as LIBOR has come up about 40% mm. this year, uh, those particular assets which are uh, uh, resetting based on LIBOR, or you're at least getting more coupon. Uh, there is a real risk, however, and that mm. is that if short rates go up so much more, much more precipitously even than we've seen, uh, that's going to cause stress to corporate uh, borrowers uh, who are already over levered uh, on an absolute basis relative to history. Uh, the good news is because rates have been down for so long, debt service coverage ratios have been very, very strong. That could ultimately change with this environment. I think there's a, there's a friction point at which, or an inflection point at which, uh, if rates went up any further by Fed action or other central banks uh, action around the globe or even just LIBOR going up as much as it has, uh, that we are going to potentially see a tremendous credit uh, uh, pinch, if you will, or even crisis uh, for corporate issuers. So it's not without risk, um, but 
uh, that is a, that is one area that has historically performed well in a rising rate environment, uh, and uh, and we do believe that uh, the rate uh, curve, the shape of the curve, is likely to, if this continues for much longer, potentially even invert. So it makes it a very tricky time to be a fixed income investor right now. A quick um, yeah. add-on, you know, from the value mm -hmm. growth perspective, if the rates go up. You would think that you know in the growth area, there's a lot of companies that are based uh, in terms of valuation that to justify the current share price on a discounted cash flow model. Uh, that always includes a discount rate. If the discount rate goes up as a result of short-term rates going up, it means the terminal value comes down. Therefore, it's harder to justify the current valuation. So I think rates going up typically has been a bit of a depressant, uh, if not uh, downright difficult, for growth uh, stocks and those who are valued or can entirely be valued on DCF. If you go to the value side, you know, clearly if rates go up too much, it can have a negative impact on the economy. It could affect their sales and, and earnings, but it doesn't go up too much. It doesn't really affect the economy too much. Of course, it's a Federal Reserve job to make sure that they don't raise rates to the mm. point where they start killing off the econo economy. Uh, just looking at the pension funds of a lot of our uh, holdings, I mean, a lot of our uh, you know, in value stocks, our industrial consumer products and service companies with legacy uh, liabilities, uh, pension funds or underfunded pension funds being a big part of that, uh, those also, the pension benefit obligation, liability side of these pension plans, mm. are determined uh, quite often with these, are, are largely determined with the discount rates as well. That goes up, massive uh, improvement in the underfundedness. Uh, just a company called Arconic that uh, we happen to know has a $3.2 yes. billion dollar pension, uh, unfunded pension liability. Uh, sensitivity analysis says one percentage point improvement, i.e. higher discount rate, reduces that liability by a billion dollars. So that's all good for, mm. uh, for the value stocks. And our conics down something like 18% this morning, I noticed on the Bloomberg. Yes, so uh, that's a good buy. May, maybe this becomes, yes. Absolutely. Uh, Very good. In, in general, does that become a thing that, that uh, if you're, that there is a buying opportunity in, in, in companies with, uh, with pensions with big deficits if you think that rates well, are going it's, up? it's one thing to look at. I'm just right. saying there's a general hmm. impact of interest rates across the board. There's so many impacts, but that's one of them. Yeah. I think there's... Um, uh, a huge opportunity for shorting again. So uh, there, there, there were two major things that happened uh, with low rates to why shorting has become close to impossible and there's very few people who actively short for a living that are still mm. alive. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, so the first is, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and I've been shorting stocks since mm. I got in the business. Um, you used to receive a large rebate for shorting. Um, you know, I can remember times when I was getting five, six percent that you receive yeah. right. uh, for shorting sh stock. So if the stock doesn't move, you actually collect five percent. Um, up until about a year ago, uh, the rebate rates were flat to negative. So it actually cost you money to short. Um, and yeah. so that changes the calculus quite considerably uh, on your expected return. But much more importantly, from a fundamental perspective, having extremely low rates has allowed the inferior companies to survive much longer than they should have. Mm. You know, their access to capital has been unusually good, and, and so a lot of problems that would normally show up where bankers are unwilling to lend to you because you have either an inferior business model or inferior capital allocation or inferior mm. operations, um, I suspect you will see dramatic separation between the good and the bad when the bad are no longer able to borrow so cheaply. So if, if rates go up, we get delayed Schumpeterian creative destruction, and if you're short the companies that get destroyed, that's a great opportunity. Yes. This sounds great. Right, invisible, invisible hands helps us along. Uh, with rising rates, so I look not just at the rising rates, but mm. with the inflation, the GDP growth acceleration, and the falling dollar, but what we see is splits between sizes of companies. So we see opportunities mm. for small caps rather than large caps in rising rates. Uh, we also see some more opportunities. Um, historically, energy does far better than anything on inflation. Uh, and again, it's got to be upstream, not right. the downstream, and probably smaller rather than larger because they've got less hedging. So with less hedging, then they're allowing their stock to go up with the rising price. Right. Um, then you've got uh, financials are probably showing some good opportunities right. with rising rates. They get their spreads back in the banks. But again, you've got to break it down into the subsectors. Um, healthcare, for example, we've seen 
uh, again, small, outperforming large with the health care services and equipment really doing well and the biotech pharma not so much with the biotechs underperforming and pharma outperforming. So there's a lot of choices and rising rates. I just saw a big red sign saying <laughs> session over. <laughs> Alex, would you, do you want to have a final word? If anybody is hungry to ask questions rather than go to lunch, there are a few more minutes before lunch. A Alex? Yeah, just very quickly. I, look, I, I think Ray, right, I agree with what Jason said about you know the low the low the low rate environment we've been in for such a long time has been able allowed companies to sort of hide their financial un, uh, you know kind of uh, underperformance and you know sort of having them be required to sort of be more efficient with how they de deploy capital mm -hmm. which is what really what happens when rates go up will actually be very good from a, from an activist point of view we in those kinds of markets I think that's the best kinds of markets because you can put pressure on the company mm -hmm. to put it to alter there. So between the bond markets and active investors like yourselves, you, you're all f true to Schumpeter. We, we That's will, right. Uh, we will do true some destroying and we'll do it creatively. <laughs> uh, I think it's lunchtime. If anybody does want to ask a, ask a question, we're all, we're all still here. Or otherwise, you can chat with our panelists straight afterwards. Does, does anyone have a question? OK. Everybody's hungry for food. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a great conversation.